This is On the Market, a Bigger Pockets podcast presented by Fundrise. Hey everyone, welcome to On the Market. I am joined here with Jamil Damji coming to me from Phoenix, LA. Where are you? I'm in Phoenix today, uh, enjoying life, enjoying uh, all of the all of the funness. <laughs> <laughs> that comes what you, in. What's what's the funness? What do you? What's the funness? Well, um, you know, we 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 actually got some offers on some of our flips. That's been really relieving to me. Um, beyond that, I'm almost done filming season two of our television show. So, like, I'm about to become a free man. Dude, you've literally been saying that since I met you, which was <laughs> at least six months ago. <laughs> it's so hard. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you're right this time. Yeah, me too. Me too. But I'm super, this, this guest was amazing. Oh yeah. John, John is great. And honestly, a lot of people have been uh, messaging me and asking me and saying like, you know, a lot of people come on the show, share a similar opinion. If you're looking for a contrarian opinion, that's not like that wild. I don't think it's like crazy, but like a very informed opinion about what you think is going to happen the next couple of years. Um, listen to this interview because John has access to data none of us do. He has his own consultancy firm. Um, and, and he just provides so much good context and things that I'm good to go sit in a dark room and think about for the next like three hours. <laughs> really, though, I think one of the most enlightening conversations I've had uh, all year. So you guys are in for it. With that, we're going to bring in John Burns, who's the founder of John Burns Real Estate Consulting. But first, we're going to take a quick break. John Burns, welcome to On The Market. Thank you so much for being here today. Oh, I'm looking forward to this. You guys are great. Thank you. Well, I've been following you and your company for quite a while, and I'm a big fan of your work. But for those of our audience who aren't familiar with you and your company, can you just give us a brief background? Sure. I, I started it 21 years ago to figure out what was going on in the housing market for investors, mostly big companies. And there's 115 of us now that are trying to figure that out. We have we have a research subscription that we for big companies. It's pretty expensive, and then we also do about 900 consulting studies a year. Very that's very skewed to new home development. Wow. So it's safe to say you've you've figured out the housing market, right? You know everything <laughs> that's going to happen over the next couple of months. <laughs> no, I mean we. Our, 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 our purpose statement is to solve today to help navigate tomorrow. So I, I think we're pretty good at solving today. What's going to happen tomorrow, your guess is as good as mine. Well, that's it. <laughs> I was hoping we would. That's why we brought you on, John. You're going to tell everyone exactly well, I, what was going to happen. I, so I, we'll just end the interview here. <laughs> I, I do have a guess. So I can I can tell you what, what our guess. I mean, I have to decide whether I'm going to how aggressively we're going to grow our business. So this is a. Uh, uh, near and dear to me, believe me. Well, I'm just, I'm just kidding. Obviously, we'd love, to, would love to learn as much as we can from you. Um, so, just tell me a little bit over the last 21 years, like what are the key variables? What's the data, the economic indicators that you're looking at to help understand what's happening in the housing market? So, so when I started the business 21 years ago, it, it was hard to find data. So we were getting out and finding data. And now there's just too much data. I feel like we're we've become a data data filter. Um, and we're still looking for more data. Um, you know, at the end of the day, the local market from a macro standpoint is all about job growth and that's free data. It's available from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Always compare July to last July because it's, it's seasonal. We do that for our clients. That'll tell you whether your local economy is growing or not. And, and there's two surveys. The right answer is usually right in between both surveys. Um, so I advise everybody to do that. And then on the supply side, I know you're monitoring listings and things, and we can get into the new home market versus the resale market because I think they're going to behave massively differently this cycle. Uh, but, you know, just monitoring listings and days on the market. The, the, everybody can do that. Uh, but that's a very short-term indicator that can tell you what's going to happen. The, the job growth will tell you not whether or not your market is adding more people who can afford to rent your house or not. I love that. It's so simple. Yeah, do, I, I, how did I build a business just on that? I don't know. <laughs> I, mean, I, I think that's the key, though, right? The more simple that you can make what you do so that people can digest the information, the better, right? I, from 
the perspective of of your average investor in real estate for the most of us that are involved in in i guess the information that you're disseminating we're looking at it from a resale perspective right and there's not a lot of people that i know that are you know huge new home builders for the most part what we do is we we buy distressed property fix and flip them and so um i'm gonna if you don't mind dave i just want to i want to come out the gate swinging here i want to understand um what do you because you said something that that is like all the light bulbs in my head right now are firing off how different is the new home market and the resale market going to look coming around the corner here well we're recording this at the end of august and the typical home builder in america has already dropped price five percent i don't think the resale market has done that so the the home builders are leading indicators and there's actually 23 of them that are publicly traded, so you can listen to their calls for free, and they'll tell you what's going on right up to the minute. Um, there are businesses that are going to end up with empty homes that need to be sold, and actually, they're going to convert. They are converting quite a few of them to rentals, uh, and that was they hadn't thought of that 20 years ago. So that's going to be an interesting play here, but that's what you might call a desperate seller. Um, even though their balance sheets are really strong, I wouldn't say they're desperate, but they're businesses. The resale market, as long as the economy is growing and people are not moving or not losing their job, they're not desperate to sell their house. In fact, they're, if they bought their home more than a year ago, they're sitting on a ton of equity. They can just stay put. So I'm one, and the, the mortgages this cycle, as you know, have been pristine. So I'm wondering where the supply is going to come from in the resale market, and I don't think there's going to be a ton of supply. I mean, it needs to, I think we needed to, we figured out it needed to increase 800% just to get back to normal. I mean, that's how ridiculously low it was. <laughs> that's from its low point though, right? Not from right now. Yeah, okay. yeah, it was, you know, it was maybe not quite that much. Maybe that was actually, that was a new home stat, but it needed to, to, increase significantly just to get back to a normal level. Um, and I don't know where that increase is going to come from unless j Powell is successful in, in engineering a really bad recession. And it seems weird to say successful about a recession. But it, it, in my view, that's, that's the only thing he can control to get inflation down. And um, he's got a long way to go because the economy is still super strong. Unemployment is still super low. Maybe he'll get lucky, something will happen and inflation will tame down, or we just end up with inflation for a very long time, which will be high borrowing rates, which people don't like. John, would you mind uh, clarifying that to me? Because I'm, we're obviously seeing something a little different right now in the, in the short term, right, with respect to listings and, and how things have sort of shifted since we've seen the interest rate spikes and all the people that were thinking of selling have rushing into the market and, and putting their listings on the market, which is obviously swelled, swelled inventory in many markets. I, one of the markets that I'm in, I'm in 132 different markets. Just to give you backstory on me, I run a, a wholesale franchise operation and we're all over the country. Primarily though, the majority of our volume is sitting in Phoenix, Arizona, and we're fixing and flipping robustly out here. And throughout the year, you know, we, we started the year off with we would, we would finish a house, we'd put it on the market and it would sell immediately over list, all kinds of crazy, crazy scenarios there. Um, and now since the market has started, you know, turning the corner, we've seen that our, our flips are sitting longer. We're taking price reductions. We're getting, you know, low ball offers with something that we hadn't seen in, in quite some time. Do you think this is temporary? Because from what you just said that this, the resale market has, is, is not, going to have enough inventory to meet demand uh is this is this all a temporary blip where we saw this huge rush of listings and then maybe coming around the corner that might disappear all right well you're not gonna like my answer because you're you're like a home builder i mean you you if you've got a house that needs to get sold and it's empty you've got to sell and you've got to find the market so that's ex that's exactly what's going on the difference is hopefully for you, you're trying to find the market where there's not a lot of other homes for sale. And so, yeah, maybe you have to price it back where things were in January or maybe even last spring or something when you got into the deal. And nobody likes that. 
But if you're out in a new home area, they tend to be, you know, the t- be 10 builders across the street from each other and there's 100 empty homes for sale, that, that, that's a much more distressful situation. And the only advice I would say is you, you got to find the market. You bu- made that investment when interest rates were three and your consumer was going to be able to uh, buy the home or maybe, uh, some, maybe a la- somebody would buy it from you and rent it out and borrow at three. Now they got to borrow at five. They just have to pay less. And that, that's what's happened. John, you, you said, and I tend to agree that the, the new home market and the uh, existing home market are sort of going to per- behave differently in this cycle. Do you have any context, like how big the new home market is compared to the existing home market? And is it possible that trouble with builders and new construction could start bleeding into the existing home market? Yeah, the, the new home market is about 11% of all the sales in the country or something like that. And historically, it's usually around 15. So the, the lack of construction everybody's been talking about is, is part of the reason why it's less. You know, existing home sales are coming down so quickly, maybe they'll be at 15 pretty darn quickly. Uh, but that's a national number. I mean, you, you know, if you're, you're in Denver, it's, it's, it's out by the airport where there's a lot of new homes and it's not near Stapleton where there used to be a lot of new homes. It's a very different submarket and, and behavior. I'm impressed by your knowledge of Denver. That's, do you live in Denver? <laughs> <laughs> no, but we, we, we do 70 pages on 100 metro areas. And I've, and I've, I've traveled enough to have gone to all thir- home games at all 30 Major League Baseball teams. So I've, I travel a fair amount. <laughs> wow, that's a very cool like bucket list claim to fame. Uh, I know, I know. They keep building new stadiums, so I got to get going again. So one of the what, what we're talking about so far, I, I presume, is mostly with single family homes. Is that right? Yeah. I mean, we could talk townhomes are similar to me. Apartments are different. So can you tell us a little bit about how apartment conditions are a little bit different than townhomes and single families? Well, right now it's a completely different story. And when you jack mortgage rates, you tell renters who want to be homeowners, you got to stay renting. So the demand has uh, gotten even stronger, which is really the challenge for the Fed I think the CPI measure, I think 30% of that is rent. So when mortgage rates go up, they're actually pushing inflation up, not down, because rent's such a big component of it. Their favorite metric is uh, something called PCE. I think it's about 17%. But they're, they're, they're doing that really, in my view, to kill the economy, because that, that's what they need to have happen. So demand slows, so inflation calms back down. Uh, because history has shown that sustained inflation can actually be long-term worse for the economy than just ripping off the Band-Aid and having a short recession like hap- what well, happened twice in the early 80s. I-, I hope we don't have to go there again, but it's it's starting to smell like that to me. So this is this we sort of talked about the long-term and short-term prospects. Given what's happening in the new construction market and uh, you know, home builders are having a hard time selling. Do you think we're going to start to see, and we've already seen construction start to slow down, but do you think there is a risk similar to the last recession where we just saw home building fall off a cliff and it took years, um, almost a decade for it to come back to that level? Is there a risk that we're going to enter another period where we already have a housing supply issue in the U.S. and it's maybe going to get worse? Um yeah, well, it's it's going down. I mean, 23 public builders have told you they're going to start less homes next year for the most part. So I'm not forecasting other than telling you what the guys who are going to build it are saying is going to happen. Uh, so many things are different this time, and I hate that phrase. But, um, I mean, we are building less. We're not building 2 million homes. We're, we're building a million seven, so still pretty high. Uh, there is a big pig, pig in the python of all these unsold homes that are under construction that are going to get finished over the next 12 months. So I, I, I do think that's what's going to drive prices down. Uh, and the, but, but what is different is the builder balance sheets, public and private home builders, have never been stronger. Never. And, and in fact, we just pulled them on our client webinar last week. Uh, whether, so sales are down dramatically. Housing market should be the poster child for the industry that's getting destroyed. We, at, we pu- pulled 400 clients and said, do you have more employees than you did at the beginning of the year? And only, tw- I think it was 20% of them had fewer. 
and only 30% said they were going to have fewer 12 months from now, which is very consistent with what they've been telling me is like, John, we made so much money and we borrowed uh, very conservatively. And if we have a recession, I don't like it, so be it. But I'm not letting go of my good people and I'm not dropping land and, you know, I won't grow as much. So that, that's a different story than the last cycle where people were borrowing money like crazy and the consumer was levered up to their eyeballs with subprime debt. But most consumers can afford the payment. They're fixed rate payments with their current jobs and they're getting better raises than they were anticipating due to inflation. So um, I don't think we see anything like last time unless the Fed induces some massive recession or something I don't see coming. John, how prevalent or important do you think the institutional investor has been in in leading up into our current situation and possibly leading out of it because there's it's interesting I, I i read a report that one of the major institutional buyers has just raised a tremendous i mean a sickening amount of money to purchase new homes and resale homes uh in the downturn that they're currently describing so so almost as if they have it they have purposely pulled back knowing that while the rates were were spiking they pulled back purchasing and everybody in the business of of buying and selling like myself felt that we all felt the institutions leave momentarily so that they could create a a a, a drop in demand and then that will automatically create a drop in pricing, but they're positioning themselves to come in and take a massive position. How impactful do you see that being in what we'll, we're gonna experience five years from now? So we have done so much research on this. Finally, someone. <laughs> no, I, I, we, we've gone down to mapping each house that the publicly traded institutions have done and, and matching it to what they're disclosing publicly. So we've, we've got it down to the house. Wow. Um, and, and the headlines are complete BS. I won't say the, the whole world, but they're, they're complete lies. Um, but, so I'll give you some clarity on that. So, so the iBuyers are 2% of the market nationally, too. Companies that own a um, hundred or more homes are three. Okay. Companies that own 10 to 99, which you're in one of those camps, <laughs> is three. And then those that own less than 10 are 19. Now, that 19 does include second homes. So there, there's, and the way we get the data is we say if the property tax bill is being sent somewhere else, this is not an owner occupant. So that's that's how we, so that you know maybe it's not perfect. But the New York Times hates you know any PE firm with that starts with black. Um, mm -hmm. Congress gets reelected when they're bashing Wall Street. So all the headlines are on that. And I'm sure, um, I'll, I'll clarify it some more. We, have it, we actually summarized it by zip codes. There are some zip codes where the percentages of buying by institutions are like five times what I just told you. So th they all have this thing they call a buy box that you're yeah. probably familiar with the term. Yes, sir. So the buy box is not in every zip code everywhere in the country. It's in fast growing metro areas right around the median home price right around the, a nice rent. That's where the competition is super severe, and I totally get it. But I'm willing to bet that people listening to Bigger Pockets is far bigger than anybody coming out of New York when you add it all up. That is incredible to me. I, and I just want to reiterate this because I just had my mind blown because you just described what I... For, leading up into this, John, I've been, I've been characterizing the private equity or the institutional buyer as the 800-pound gorilla. Yeah. And you just told me that it's actually 80. It's an 80. It's an 80 pound chimpanzee. That's really interesting. But maybe Jamil, maybe you're noticing it because they're really active in Phoenix. They're super active in Phoenix. Yes. Yeah. The percentages are bigger in Phoenix. And you would really know. Are you in Charlotte? We're in Charlotte. Yes. They're crazy active in Charlotte. Yes, sir. And, act, and actually, Dave, in Denver, it's one of the least markets where they do the least. So Denver and Austin. Really? Because it, it maybe it's just too unaffordable at that point? Well, for whatever, like Austin, it's all mom and pop. It's all, 
it's all burrs. Huh. It's it, it the the buy box is not working for the big institutions. Even even with one of the biggest institutions in the country being headquartered in Austin, I think the, those hundred plus are only buying one percent of the homes in Austin. So to just recap that, you said the I buyer is two percent of the sales, yep, of the purchases. The small institutional buyer is three percent. Well, yeah, and, and well, a hundred plus would a hundred or if they own a hundred or more nationally, they're three. Okay, so that's the large institution. That's the big private equity firm. Yeah, is that you too? No, sir. No, sir. That's not us. <laughs> no, he's just trading them. I'm trading. Yeah. So I sell. I sell to these large institutions, but you know. Um, yeah. So flippers, flippers, we think are about eight percent of the market, but they're coming in and out of that number, right? So it's it's hard. Some are in each of the buckets. I mean, you you. This is data that I don't think anyone has has put out there. You've got different. You've got different data than I have seen get. And how, so how did you track this? How, if you don't mind, I know that's proprietary probably, but how did you like get so granular with it that you got it down to the house? Uh, we bought every transaction in the country. It was very expensive. Wow. And um, we, we, did, we cheated a little bit. We did by zip code because that was easier. So if, it's, if it, the property tax bill is going to a different zip code, that's an investor. Um, and then I just have a bunch of great people with databases that know how to run the math. But the fact, and then we, we geocoded it too and, and did a lot of back checking. This took more than a year. I mean, this was not an easy assignment, but I knew it was critical to understanding the market. The risk of a massive dump in inventory by uh, a huge you know, private equity firm isn't as, as great of a risk as, as, Wall St as, as the headlines are trying or the, you know, the media outlets are trying to, to make it. Well, I'll, I'll even make you more comfortable with that statement. So if you're a REIT, which the bigger ones are, you pay a tax penalty as a REIT for selling houses. What? So, I mean, you get, you, yeah. I did not know that. Well, that you, well, a REIT, you get structured as a REIT. Your income is tax-free as a company, and you pass it on to your shareholder. So that's the REIT benefit. And, and the flip side of that is they, um, they penalize you for becoming like a regular company where you're selling homes. You have to pay regular taxes that way. And, and these are publicly, and, and also even further, they've borrowed money, putting all those homes up as security and a cash flow income stream. Their debt covenants don't allow them to sell a lot of homes. The bigger risk is the guy who owns 10 homes and, and five homes and 20 homes times the many thousands of people that there are like that. That's the person I think who dumps their home. And we've been talking to the, there's a couple brokerage services now like Rootstock and SFR Hub and others that specialize in that person. So they're clients of ours and we're asking them, when you see a surgeon selling, you be sure to let me know. And um, they've seen a little bit of a surge, but what they've learned is that those sellers need to provide great information, like how have the financials been the last year and other things to sell these homes, and they don't have it. Because <laughs> they're not a sophisticated owner, right? right? They're, they're right. small mom and pa property management companies. So they're going to have to wait for the lease to expire and then kick somebody out and sell the house to somebody else. That's, so it's not going to happen overnight. It would, it would happen over time if people are playing that game. Wow. And primarily, they've been purchasing with some tremendously low debt, right? And so leading up into this, they've been holding a lot of inventory with some very favorable terms. And so maybe that's the vacuum we're feeling right now is, they, is them leaving the space because they're, the burr's not working as well as it was seven months ago. So we have this fix and flip survey, which, which by the way, if any of your, your burr clients want to participate in that, just... Uh, send it to me at, at jburns at realestateconsulting.com and I'll get you in on the survey because we're, we're trying to stay on top of what people are doing. Um, people are exiting and then not reinvesting the proceeds yet. I know that I know that there's 1031s and other things associated with that, but they're, they're not finding deals that are as underwritable right now. In fact, I don't have the exact stats. I've got it in the survey. But the uh, percentage of ARV that they're willing to pay now versus three months ago has gone down dramatically. Do you have an average of what that has gone down? I, we have it by distribution, but uh, it's gone down, I would, I, maybe 10%. Yeah. So maybe if I was going to do a 75, I'd do a 65, something like that. 
but that means I'm going to pay less for your house or I'm going to borrow less money. Can you tell us a little bit more about that survey, John? Yeah, so it's just a, it's a survey. We, we partnered with a couple of companies, Flatiron and Sunday and some others that, that, that are involved in this business. Um, we've got a couple of clients that fund um, Fix and Flip. And uh, yeah, it's just about 10 questions. And uh, it's, but there's a lot of participants. And you're asking me these questions I don't know the answer to. I, but, if I, but if I ask a thousand people and poll them, that's what that we're hoping to get those answers and find these things out. Like I want to ask, are you going to sell? Oh, cool. Or are you going to reinvest? So our, our listeners, if they want to participate and contribute data to this survey, oh, yeah. um, they can, that's what you were saying, email you or, or go to your yeah, website. You, you, yeah, we'll, we'll get you, we do it once a quarter, we'll get you in on the next survey and then you'll get all the results in return. That's our give back. Cool. That's awesome. I mean, if you're a flipper, that's a that's a no brainer. Go Very go valid. fill out ten questions in exchange for a lot of information about your market. So we we've talked a little bit about what's going on and what's happening here, and I do want to get your opinion. I know that's not data um, supported always, and there's there's no one can predict the future. But what do you see happening over the next couple of months, and how do you feel about the long term prospect of housing valuations in the U.S.? I mean, we think they're coming down. And, and, and so that, and I'm not going to quote the percentage, but it's substantial. But let me, I'll say it another way. So, so we just went through, say, two to three years of really substantial price appreciation. What if you had to give a year of that back? Would that sound unreasonable? No. Mm-hmm. Do, do the math on that percentage in your market. Mm-hmm. It's a lot. <laughs> yeah, it is. And do you think that's going to happen universally across markets? No. Every 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 market is completely different. And so you're saying on a national level, sort of. Yeah, right. And then those stats I quoted you, they're so different in Charlotte than they are in Phoenix, than they are in Denver. I, that was all national. So this, this, this is very local. And even, like, I, I remember I, I have the Charlotte map kind of memorized in my head it's like all the east and west side of charlotte where all this activity is going on and nothing in the north and the south so it's very zip code specific john you're saying that you're seeing that housing values are are going to come down based off of the research that you've done and um some markets more than others and possibly i'm not quoting you but possibly erasing one of an entire year's worth of appreciation from from our balance sheets. What's the time frame? You know, I I I think it's quicker with des- where there's a lot of desperate sellers like home builders, and it's really slow on the re- resale side where people are not desperate. So emotions again, just like how we saw the how we saw the massive appreciation happen based off of emotions because I. I there's a there's a term that I love using. I call it emotional equity. That's where we had people coming in and overpaying by a hundred thousand, you know, two hundred thousand dollars more than a property was listed. Right. And this isn't lender backed value. This is stuff they were, you know, waiving appraisal contingencies and just coming in and slapping down, you know, cold hard cash to close this deal. And so that that equity, that appreciation that happened, uh, will disappear. And and and. And you're gonna, and you're saying it's gonna disappear as fast as as it as it came here because it's an emotional based situation. Yeah. So actually, a guy named Robert Schiller, who won the Nobel Prize not that long ago for economics, primarily won it for what you just said was his analysis on psychology, and uh, and a uh, it feeding on itself when things go up, it forces things to go up even more. And I, you know, I think we're going through a psychology shift the other way, where if now is not a good time to buy, I should wait three months or I should wait three. And I, I think that's the most likely scenario, you know, until something, some new information comes along and, and changes everything I just said. But the other part of this question that I, that I do find flippers don't talk enough about is um, the mortgage rate and the borrowing rate. When you see 40% home price appreciation and rates go from 3% to 5.5%, who thinks that doesn't matter? <laughs> I mean, it, but that's what you're saying. If you don't think prices are going to fall, you're basically saying that doesn't matter. It has to matter. Of 
course, it has yeah. to matter. Yeah, I mean, the affordability is is. I think I saw some stat recently that said it's near a forty year low um, in terms of what people can afford, and of course that matters because it dries up demand and uh, just less people are willing to get into the market. Do you think, John, this bodes so? So that's sort of your short term view. Um, what do you think? about sort of the long-term prospects of the housing market, um, because we've done some analysis at Bigger Pockets just about previous recessions, previous housing cycles. And to us, it looks like the outlier is 2008 in terms of how deep housing price declines were and how long it, it took to come back to pre-crash levels. Do you see something like that as feasible? I, I, I know you can't assign a probability or anything like that, but is it even feasible? So um, that is the data, and that's exactly what it says when you chart it nationally. If you chart it locally, you'll see that there are other precedents where things have taken just as long. Hmm. So like, like the SNL crisis happened in the mid-80s in Houston. It fell for like four or five years and took like another nine years to come back. Wow. It happened in California in, in 1990. I mean, I, my wife and I bought our first home in 91, 20% off the initial asking price and sold it five years later for a loss. Whoa. And then it, and then seven, eight years later, it came back. Yeah. So the, this has happened. Pl- yeah. Look, look at the construction starts in, in the local markets. Now, I'm not saying that's going to happen again. Those were all financial crisis. You know what happened last time? Before than that, it was the collapse of the SNL industry. There's certainly no financial crisis that I'm aware of happening in real estate. If, if they were lending on Bitcoin or lending against hedge fund portfolios or something, then, then there could be one. Um, but I don't think it should play out like that. And we are undersupplied, our view is, by about a million seven houses right now. That's a lot of undersupply. As we mentioned earlier, the apartment market is completely full until we finish all those apartments under construction that's going to stay the case so i yeah I don't, it shouldn't be something like like you just outlined so do you think the 10 per, do you think the the um cuz we 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 we're sort of playing with this number of 10% right a 10% reduction in value and do you think the 1.7 million houses that were short do you think that's what backstops that from a crash um well you know, a simple demand supply chart, I think demands and rents have already corrected for that supply. So probably priced out of those million seven people. <laughs> right. So so as you draw as you drop rents or as you drop home prices, you you allow those million seven to, you know, split up with their roommate or whatever they're going to do and get their own place. Um, so I, I do think there's an affordability component to that. But yes, the fact that we're entering this undersupplied rather than oversupplied, which was the case in 2006, is far better situation to be in. So I'll ask you the the the, the question probably on the the mind of all of our audiences: Are better buyer you know are better buying opportunities sometime in the near future rather than today? Because in your mind, prices values are going to fall. Well, the flippers have told us that. So your listeners have already, have already <laughs> said, said uh, you know, my borrowing costs are up. I can't buy. I'm not going to take a, a bet on home price appreciation like I used to. So I'm going to buy at a lower percentage of ARV. And um, this woman, Kyla Scanlon, has coined this term, kind of calling it a vibe session. We're not in a recession, but it feels like a, the vibe is like we're in a recession. I like that. Like it's exactly what you were just talking about. It's um, people are hitting pause. And when people hit pause, demand slows. What's different this time is I don't think supply is really going to skyrocket. So that's good. And people aren't going to have to go through foreclosure and, and things like that in a big way. Um that actually argues for it taking longer to get back to where prices and rents need to be. That's really interesting. Yeah, I love that, the, the vibe session. That's a good point. We, we did a whole show on this, but basically, like, we're not technically in a recession, but who really cares? Because all of the underlying economics are have been, the trends are, are, are what they are, and people are feeling like it's a recession, which is pretty much what matters. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, like, it, you... It, you, a hangover is a headache, but you can call them both the same thing, right? It's it, it's <laughs> either way, it doesn't feel good. 
<laughs> exactly. Yeah. At least you know that'll go away. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> So is there a way for a fix and flipper to bake in uh, their forecasting? Because here, the bottom line is, is that w when we do this full time for a business, right, it's very difficult to just pause and wait and say, okay, look, I'm not going to purchase right now. I'm not going to, because you've got crews that you need to be responsible for. You have wages to pay. There's things that need to keep the machine moving. Cause if you don't keep the ball moving, the, the the entire thing falls apart and then reassembling that later on is next to impossible or it looks really different from what it looked like right now and so i've seen a lot of rehabbers that i work with at least they're saying look jamil we can't pause it's impossible for us to pause we've got way too many people that we're responsible for we have a lot of inventory that we're holding we're we're going to continue pressing forward but we're going to bake in uh some understanding we're going to bake in value or we're going to bake in uh you know a deceleration in pricing whatever that whatever you want to call it um what would you say to a fix and flipper that is trying to orchestrate a business plan for the next 12 months how would you advise them so, so i mean this has been really interesting for me because you everything you just said you sounded exactly like a home builder exactly I've got all these homes, I've got all these people, what you didn't say, but is underlying in all of this is I've got a lot of debt um, that needs to get repaid. And, and that is the answer to your question. So, you know, if your debt is low, or you're able to restructure your debt, and you can be patient, you're going to be patient. If you have no choice, you got to go as fast as you can to make sure you uh, pay back your debt. And, and Dave asked about the, the builders in the last cycle going under. They had a lot of debt. This cycle, they've been able to borrow at like 4% fixed rate for, and, and it doesn't mature for six years. So they're like, I can be patient. <laughs> and, they're, and they're borrowing literally is like 30% against the asset value it's, or less. You know, if you're, if you're at 70, 80% leverage, you're in trouble. You just described how rich they're all they all are right now because right. they made so much money leading into this. So when you when you when you've insulated yourself with all of this, you know, all of these years of 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 really really great returns, it you position well to be able to come out of this in a in a in at least intact. So so if your listeners have sold some house and stuck some cash in the bank and uh, paid down their debt, um, they're fine. But if everybody rolled it back in to just keep buying more homes, which I know there's a tax incentive to do that, you're taking a lot of risk in, in a cyclical industry. And, and everybody knows housing is cyclical. So the depreciation buyer might not appreciate what you just said. Well, but they can hold on and enjoy the depreciation for a very long time. I mean, if you're, if you're in a shape where you can just rent this out and refinance with some long-term debt, you're fine. Yeah, it's fine. And the, I mean, that that's, I know I know people that did that in the last cycle too. Some some builders actually did that. There's a famous one in Houston who did that with 4,000 homes that were intended to be for sale and they ended up renting them all out. Um, it was awesome. And and, and you, you it's a different lender on a, on a perm financing on something like that. So you can get a fixed rate debt too. I mean, maybe not from everybody, but that, that's how you get through it. You rent it out. John, this has been super helpful. I, I'm curious uh, if you have any other things you think our audience of aspiring and active real estate investors should know about this uh, or, or about the housing market or where you think things are going. I'll, I'll, I'll end on a positive. <laughs> I felt like a little bit of a Debbie Downer. There. <laughs> so so uh, and I, I, don't, I think this is not discussed enough. Um, the housing boom of the early 2000s was... 18 to 20 years ago, and homes need a remodel on average, we've got the census data, 20 to 25 years after they're built. So that the number of old, tired homes that need a refresh is massive. And so we're very, we have a lot of clients who are building products, clients who sell to re, the remodelers. We're very bullish on remodeling and, and the need for rehabbing homes purely due to the number of homes that was built 20 years ago. Oh, that's fascinating. I didn't ever think about that. 
to my taste, Dave, I can't I can't live in a house that hasn't been remodeled five years ago. So I oh I, I mean, know I, <laughs> I know you 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 buy a new house every year, Jamel. But <laughs> <laughs> do you think it's possible, John? Just curious if if, if builders have all these people they're trying to employ and they don't want to build would they reallocate resources towards remodeling is that possible to some extent but you, you know they're also entering this with a labor shortage so so it's 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 not like they got have too many people they're trying to and actually home builders are different because their trades are on somebody else's payroll um but there's been such a trade shortage here i uh I think some of those trades will flip to remodeling. In fact, I'm sure of that. Yeah, that'll be interesting to see. John, I have one last question, and it's entirely selfish. I feel like the housing market is very confusing, and so is the economy right now. In your 21-year history of looking at housing market data, how does this stack up in terms of complexity and uh, normality, I guess? Uh, this is about as complicated as I can remember, but I, I think I would have answered that question the same over the last 20 years. It just seems to get more complicated. <laughs> more, yeah. there's, more, there's more things going on. And as I mentioned, there's more data to analyze. Like, oh, my God, I hadn't thought of that. You know, this flipper stuff, iBuyers. Who was talking about iBuyers before? Um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's super complicated. Which actually is kind of good for our business. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's good for our podcast. That's why we, we created it. But um, yeah, I mean, it is, I think it's reassuring to know um, for people who are new to this industry that this is complicated, that if you're like listening and feel a little bit confused about the economy, you're not the only one. I, I think the guys in charge of the economy are confused about the economy. <laughs> so, so That is a painful truth. <laughs> oh, boy. When the Fed chair is apologizing for getting it wrong, you know, don't feel bad. <laughs> All right, John. Well, we're very grateful. Um, you know, ha ha as, as investors and just people interested in the economy, we're very grateful to have uh, some time with someone like you with such great experience and access to so much unique information. So... Thank you so much. And and for anyone listening, if you want to connect with John, it sounds like the best place to do that is on your website. Or is there anywhere else they should do that, John? There's a form on our website that would be awesome. Just fill out the form and say, I want to be in the fix and flip survey. Or, or you can email at me at jburns at realestateconsulting.com. Someone will get back to you. All right. Great. John, thanks so much for joining us. All right. Take care. Dude, I, I feel like we need Kathy here to like, to calm me down. You know, we need to call her so we could have her soothe say to us for a while and make me feel better. Right? Like that was sobering and like depressing. It, but at the same time, really interesting. Right? I mean, I would have never guessed that nineteen percent of the properties owned are just mom and pop investors. Like I, I have been, my eyes have been on these institutional investors in wall street and it's like it's like one of those moments where I, you realize that you've been diverted like your attention's been di diverted to the wrong thing and meanwhile the actual the actual situation is happening behind the scenes and and it was incredible to hear john describe that totally yeah i, I think it's one of these things when you look at data or read about data where it's like, is institutional investors going up? Probably, you know, but just like with inventory and other stuff in the housing market right now, is it going up from 1% to 1.5%? Will that impact a market? Sure. Is it gonna impact the national housing market? Eh, pr probably not that much. So it's really important to, to get those sobering facts from someone like John, who, who obviously knows. I mean, I just, I guess what I feel like, you know, if the housing market goes down, that obviously is bad for homeowners, for a lot of investors. That that sucks. I think what's like making me just feel sad right now is like just the lack of consensus. It's like every person you talk to, it's completely different. And the only truth is that no one knows right now. And it's honestly great. It's so good to have an alternative perspective. It's so, so important because we've had other like really prestigious analysts like Logan Motoshami and Rick Sharga on the show, super experienced, saying something pretty different from that. So totally different. You know, it, I, I think the theme though that we've seen like through the last couple of shows is like every market is going to. 
be really different from here on out. And you really just got to understand your niche. I think that's really important, Dave. And I think that a reason why the Bigger Pockets audience really needs to pay attention to this is because it, no one is going to give you the the silver lining or that that one stop shop answer. You've got to get you've got to get into your local RIAs. You've got to get into your local marketplace. You've got to talk to the buyers out there. You've got to talk to the rehabbers out there. You've got to talk to the lenders out there, the hard money lenders. You've got to really do research for yourself to understand: Am I am I in a market right now that that has the fundamentals? that are gonna remain strong so that I can make a decision. I mean, guys, he did not say that it was bad everywhere. In fact, there was there was a lot of positivity in those markets where that had strong job growth, right? If you've got strong job, job growth in your market, you're, you really do have some insulation. So paying attention to these key market indicators are super important in making a decision on how you're gonna progress your real estate investing business. Honestly, like something about this makes me a little bit excited and feel like I have a bit of an advantage because the last two years, it's like you just throw a dart at a dartboard and you're going to make some money. Right. And now, now it's a, it's kind of like a researcher's market. You know, like if you're yeah. someone who likes to understand what's really going on in your market, you're going to have a huge advantage. And listen, there's flip sides to every, to both of these things. I feel like people I talk to, half the people are like, oh no, I'm so fearful of housing markets going down. And the other half are like, can't wait, can't wait till the housing market goes down. Right. And, and the, just, just the truth is that every market, like he said, even in Charlotte, new construction is different from existing homes. The north side is different from the east and west side. Single family assets are different from multifamily assets. There are going to be opportunities, but you're gonna have to try harder and honestly, that's that's a good thing. Like when it yes. was easy the last few years, look how much competition you were facing. Everyone was out there trying to buy stuff because it was so easy. When it gets harder, the people who are committed to it and the people who really understand it have an advantage. And so not wishing for anyone to lose money, but I'm just saying it means there will be opportunity. If John's right, who knows? <laughs> yeah, well, I think that's great. You are right. And the good news is, guys, is that you're tuning into a podcast that's going to keep you abreast of all of the information that we can find out there, right? We're going to hear from all of the point of views, whether it be from somebody with a really optimistic, robust point of view of where things are going to somebody who's looking at it from a different perspective. Always know that if you're making decisions based on data, that you're doing a much better job than people that are just throwing darts at a dartboard. <laughs> totally, dude. I, I mean, I think the thing I love about this show and everyone who's on this show, I'm going to toot our own horn a little bit, is like everyone just seems so willing to learn. Like we're just taking information and, and changing your opinion. And I think that's so important. So many people you see have said the market's going to crash and they've been saying it for seven years. They won't admit that they were wrong seven years ago. And like, we don't know what's going to happen. Like, I, I don't know if John's right or if Logan's right or whoever, but what we can commit to you is that we're going to keep just bringing on people who, who are smart and who understand the industry and give you as much information possible. And hopefully you can make good investing decisions with that. All right, man. Well, it was great having you on. Really appreciate it. And uh, hopefully we'll have you again soon. Always good to see you, brother. Well, thank you everyone for listening. We will see you all again next week. On the Market is created by me, Dave Meyer, and Kaylin Bennett. Produced by Kaylin Bennett. Editing by Joel Esparza and Onyx Media. Copywriting by Nate Weintraub. And a very special thanks to the entire Bigger Pockets team. The content on the show On the Market are opinions only. All listeners should independently verify data points, opinions, and investment strategies.